years. Well, I, I have to congratulate all of you. It looks like we've actually all come right on the hour, which is absolutely terrific. And like to uh, welcome everyone again to our latest Minds, Technology, and Society seminar. I want to remind everyone that this is sponsored uh, generously by the Glushko Samuelson Fund. And we have today from the University of California at Irvine, we have Professor John Duffy, uh, Professor of Economics. John's been my very good friend and I consider him one of my mentors. He's given me a ton of help over the years, so you, um, it's just an extra special pleasure for me personally to um, uh, be able to welcome him to all. And uh, John will be speaking with us today on social learning and the title of the paper is Lone Wolf, Lone Wolf or Herd Animal. Okay, so. Peter, it's great to be here. I haven't been to UC Merced before, so I'm very thrilled to be here. I'm actually uh, from the Central Valley. I was born in Bakersfield, so uh, very familiar the smell of alfalfa in the morning. Uh, so I have great memories. Um, all right, so this uh, paper is with uh, uh, longtime collaborator Ed Hopkins and I from Edinburgh, who uh, we've been doing work on learning and games. Tatiana Kornienka was a student of mine. I introduced Tatiana to Ed, and they're now married, okay? Uh, I'm not married to these guys, but uh, we're married as a, we're now, we decided we would write a paper together, that was our goal. So this is it, and I, it's good to start with a cartoon, right? So, um, it's a, a, a normal day at the nation's financial institutions. Uh, I've got a stock here that would really excel, sell, 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 sell. This guy says, this is madness, I can't take this anymore. Goodbye, bye, 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 bye. bye. <laughs> so, so what does the cartoon illustrate? Um, well, I guess to non-economists, or to economists as well, it might be an example of you know conformism or a natural tendency to heard or ride on the information of others. And that's going to really be the subject of the talk today is, um, you know, to what extent is herding rational or to what extent is it a taste? Okay, that's the big question here. In economics, we have a model of social learning, which I can briefly review with you, which can rationalize paying attention to what other people do for the simple reason, it's an instrumental reason, that there might be value in the information of other people, right? It's not irrational necessarily to follow the herd. Um, the classic model of this in economics is by Banerjee and Bikanchani Hirschleifer and Welsh. I'll describe it to you in, in, in pretty simply. The idea is that there's some true binary state of the world, say red or blue. You don't know what it is. Uh, people are making decisions in some long line of decision makers. The first person gets a private, noisy signal of this true state. Um, it's informative. It means that the precision of the signal is greater than 50%, but it's less than 100%. Okay? So the first person, maybe he gets a signal that the state is blue. Okay? He should then choose blue as his guess for the state of nature. Then the second person who comes after him draws a signal from the same uh, urn, let's say, with the same signal precision, maybe their draw is blue as well. Okay? In which case, is the, the second decision maker, though, can condition his decision on what the first person has already chosen. Not the first person's signal, but the first person's guess. Okay? So if I, if, I, if I was Mr. Two and I drew a blue signal, the first person had guessed blue, I would be pretty confident the state of the world was blue and I would probably guess blue as well. Right? But if the second guy gets a signal that's red, right, and the first guy gets blue, then we're back to a kind of 50-50 prior in some sense about what the state of the world is. In that case, it's the second mover, I might go with my own private information and guess red. And that creates a dilemma for the third guy. He sees a blue and a red, and then what should he do? Probably go with his signal. But at some point, at some point, right, there's enough uh, what we hope are these private draws, and, and we look at sort of the majority of what people have done ahead of us, and at some point, it may be rational to ignore our own private information and just follow the herd, right? The, 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 the majority guesses of people who come ahead of us. If you've ever read online reviews, this will be familiar 
to you, right? Many people will go with uh, a majority opinion about the quality of a restaurant, for example, okay? Um, so, so the upshot of this literature is it can be rational to ignore your own private information to go with social information, okay? Um, and so what's our question? Well, our question is, um, is, is social learning truly driven by these instrumental concerns? And by instrumental, we mean, you know, a means to an end. The social information is valuable about the true state of nature. Or um, is it a matter of taste? So uh, could there possibly be intrinsic motivations? Are some people predisposed to just like social information? Or are some people predisposed to just like private information, we call it? We're going we're gonna, to... Um, we're going to give these uh, types of names. And these questions are difficult to examine in standard social learning framework because in the model that I just described to you, the standard approach, players receive both pieces of information. They see what has, been, what has happened ahead of them in the line, and they also get a private piece of information. So what's happened ahead of them is the social information, and now they're getting a private draw as to the true state. And so they get both pieces of information. It's, di it's difficult to differentiate uh, in instrumental from intrinsic motivations, okay? So that's, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna have a little theory and we're gonna have an experiment. That's the, the structure of the, the paper, okay? But is it clear what I, uh, the trade-off, or the one up, it's not trade-off, but it's two different motivations for social learning. So let's talk about the demand for social learning. Let me ask you this, I want you to think about this. So if you're plopped down in a, in a foreign place, um, you know, do you, ask for directions, that's kind of social information, right? Or do you just say, oh, I'll just uh, find my own way here, right? That's kind of like, I'll you know, private, I'll just rely on my private signals of where I think I am, right? Yeah? There's a, a, a you know, there's a stereotype uh, gender-wise about this, right? So men, you know, like, they never ask for directions, and women are more social in asking for directions, right? And, and, and it's not just on gender divide, right? There's, there's lots of observations suggest that there might be different types of players um, that might have tastes for different types of information. And so the question we're gonna ask is, are people, are people social, did they look on, at social information even when it's not optimal to do so? Are they herd animals in some sense? Or do they rely on private signals when it's not optimal to do so? Are they what we'll call lone wolves, okay? And, and possibly they're rational in the sense that they, they use the information that's most informative given the environment they're in. So we're gonna have a framework for, for differentiating between rational use of information, private or social, or a taste-based preference for these types of information, okay? So this is applicable, I hope, to lots of settings that you can think of. Um, I'll try to give some examples as we go along. Um, there is some prior evidence that addresses this question. Uh, it's of an experimental nature. I can uh, go through it briefly. There's some work by Anderson and Holt that tests the standard sequential model where you've guessed the unknown but constant uh, state of the world. And there's some evidence for herding. Sometimes you can get what are called uh, information cascades where everybody starts ignoring their private information, just go with the social information. But the, the problem with that is you can end up in a good cascade where everyone has coordinated on the true state of the world, or you can end up in a bad cascade where everyone is coordinated on the bad state of the world, right? Everyone's guessing it wrong, but in a, in a, in a Bayesian rational sense, they're doing the right thing, right? Given what people have done ahead of them. And this can explain all kinds of phenomena like smoking, for example, that's an old example. Um, so people think that, uh, you know, well, everyone else is smoking, my private signal is I'm coughing a lot, but nevertheless, <laughs> must be a good thing to do. Uh, there's evidence that people, uh, some people, um, so, so some of these cascades are more frequent than theory would predict, which suggests maybe evidence of herding. There's evidence that people irrationally choose to see uh, other uninformative guesses in some context. There's also evidence that people might be lone wolves. In a meta study of these social learning experiments, people find that uh, the, the finding is that these subjects suboptimally overweight their own private information. It's their private signal, they give more weight to it than would be uh, rational. And, and by rational, I mean, you know, in the, in the Bayesian uh, updating manner. Okay, is that clear to everybody? I hope. Okay, so 
please stop me. I, I, I know people have different conventions, but it's okay to ask me questions. I prefer to address them as, I, as I'm thinking about them. I'm usually a better responder that way, so feel free to interrupt me. Okay, um, I can go into some details with the standard design and uh, issues about that, but this might not be the best audience to discuss about it. You know, when you write a paper, you have to kind of gently trample on the competition, right? So <laughs> this is where I'm doing that, but you know, maybe I uh, save you the uh, academic stuff. Here's a summary of what I was going to say anyway. So the standard design, the standard design, is that people get both private and social information. Okay? And uh, my new design, what we're going to do is we're going to have people choose the information they want to see. Okay? So uh, in economics, we call this a revealed preference approach. Right? We're going to reveal your preference by your choice. Okay? We're not going to suppose that you have some kind of preference. The structure of moves in the standard design is sequential, um, so people take turns in a line, right? Ours is going to be simultaneous, and this is going to be more efficient in some sense that I hopefully will make clear later uh, as to the motivations that people have, whether it's bias or it's uh, instrumental concern. And the environment we're going to study is also different. The standard model has a permanent state of the world that you're learning about. It's the state is red or the state is blue. Okay. We're going to have a variable state of the world, and it's going to turn out that varying the state of the world that you're learning about is going to help us also disentangle whether people are rational or whether they have biases for social or private information. Okay. So that's a kind of overview. Here's the, the things that we add to this. Okay, so let me give you a preview of the results. I always like to have the results out there first in case I don't get to them, right? Um, so here's the results. We're going to find, uh, using our what we call within subject design, that there's quite a bit of type heterogeneity. Okay? In our framework, each subject is going to participate in two environments. In one environment, it's going to be optimal to follow social information. In the other environment, it's going to be optimal to follow, pro to follow private information. Okay? So in the aggregate, we find a pretty high degree of rationality, about 50% of our subjects make 100% optimal information choices, but only a fifth of our subjects are perfectly rational in both environments. As we're going to find evidence for herd animals and lone wolves, um, and about a fifth of the subjects have a strong bias towards one type of information. These are equally split. About half of these who are not perfectly rational are going to be pure lone wolves and half are going to be pure herd animals. Yeah. Can you just clarify what you mean by half the subjects made 100% optimal info choices? Yeah, um, I mean that, uh, so, um, I mean that across both of these environments that I'm going to talk about, about 50% of our subjects always made the right information choice. So that in all, so both environments have multiple repetitions. Yeah. In every repetition, they did the right thing. So how is that? So how does that jive with the second line, the next line, that only a fifth are perfectly rational? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Okay. It's not. It's. It's half the time. You could think. Uh, this is. A, yeah. It's kind of a misnomer. Um, half of subjects made. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so. Um, yeah, okay, this is, this should, this should, sh I should say this, in each environment means in one environment, okay? In one environment, 50% of the subjects made 100% optimal choices. That's what it means. And there are two choices? And there's, there's two environments. And in each environment, there's how many choices? Uh, I think there's 48 in each. So, 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 okay, so, so there's a lot of choices in each, yeah. So that's what it means, okay? That's actually an important point, so I'm going to because I'm going to emphasize that whether you look at the whether you look at the environment in what's called a between subject uh, framework, where you just look at one environment, as opposed to comparing behavior in two environments, you get a very different outcome in terms of the frequency of rational choices. Yeah, was there a question here? Yeah, I was going to ask if you could. Uh, say again what the environments were. Yeah, it's co it's coming. I'm just oh, okay. I'm, I'm okay. sorry about the slow rolling here. Uh, um, 
It's coming. Uh, in fact, uh, maybe I can just skip to it. Let's see. Um, uh, could I ask one more thing? Yeah. So with perfectly rational, uh, is there like some benefit that people are getting then? Or are you going to get to that too? Yeah, yeah. I'm get, uh, let me just get to the model because this is, you guys are already asking good <laughs> questions. Uh, let's see. I can skip this page. Okay. Here's the model. Okay. So the model. We don't have a good name for our model, so we called it NPQ model. <laughs> Why? Because there's three parameters, N, P, and Q, okay? So all you gotta do is remember these three parameters. Very simple model, really simple. Okay, so N, N is the size of the subject pool, the population size, finite, okay, it's finite. There is a game theoretic aspect to this, but it's trivial. Um, okay, there's two periods to our game, in some sense, uh, it's a game, yeah. So there's, a, okay, there's an uncertain binary state of the world. Think red or blue. Actually, we use it red and black. That's what we have, red and black. Um, and it's common to everyone. The state of the world is common to everyone. Okay? In each period, the subjects are trying to guess the state of the world. And your goal in life, this is your question, I think, you get a large a dollar payoff if your guess matches the state of the world. And you get zero otherwise, okay? So we're all trying to guess the uh, state of the world, okay? It can be anything, like the quality of a restaurant or uh, who's going to win an election or something like that, okay? The subjects are going to, the participants are going to all make their guesses simultaneously. So we, the end guys, um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what information they have on the next slide. They're going to guess simultaneously. If each one guesses it correctly, they get this amount. It's, I think, $6 or something like that. Okay, so here's the information. Here's the other two parameters of the model. So P and Q. Okay, In, remember it's a two period model. In the first period, the subjects receive private information with accuracy Q. Okay, Q is gonna be the precision of the signal that you receive about the true state of the world, precision. Okay. Q is noisy but informative because it has a probability greater than a half but less than one. Okay. Okay. So in our, in our experiment, the Q is going to be 0.7. So think of it that way. Um, so what should you do in period one? You draw this signal that's, say, 70% accurate as to the true state. Rational best response is follow your signal. Your draw was red. You say red. Your draw was black. You say black. Okay. Do they know the accuracy? What? Yeah, they know the accuracy. The accuracy is known. Okay. Okay. The way the way this is implemented, if this helps, is um, we tell them. Imagine there's two urns. Okay. The red urn and the black urn. Okay. The prior on the urn is 50/50. Okay. But the precision. That, so think of it this way. There's a uh, there's 10 balls in the black urn, okay? And seven of the 10 balls are black in the black urn, and three are red. In the red urn, seven of the 10 balls are red, and three are black, okay? So what's gonna be happening is you're gonna be drawing a ball with replacement, you're gonna look at your ball, and you're gonna say, hmm, what's the state of the world? Okay, and, and, and the precision is known, okay? It's known because I just tell, I told you that. Right? In fact, in some experiments, we, we gave the subjects experience just with drawing balls and verifying that the precision was what we said it was, in case there was any doubt. Right. Okay, so first period, what you should do is you just draw your signal and you should guess according to your signal. The interesting thing happens in the second period. So between the periods, first of all, this is where P comes in, the state of the world remains the same with probability P, okay? So if it was red, with probability P, it'll be red in period two. And with probability one minus P, it will switch to black. If it was red in period one, it switches to black with probability one minus P, okay? So P, think of it as the persistence of the state, okay? That's easy to remember, P for persistence. So in the second period, the agents choose whether to see the private signal with accuracy Q, the, this, this precision is about the state of the world that's in period two now, okay? And it may have changed. So I can get another private draw, okay, in period two, or, or 
I can look at the first period guesses of all the n subjects, okay? Again, including myself. I can also exclude myself. But I can look at what did people do in the first period, okay? And, but, but now there's this complication that the state of the world may have changed as well, right? Okay? You understand? Uh, yeah? Yeah, just go ahead. So they, they get to see the entire uh, um, set of guesses and not just a summary statistic. Yeah, them. they see the entire set of guesses, yeah. Um, well, I mean, the summary statistic would be the same as the entire set. So, so there, if there were nine people, as there will be in our experiment, you would see something like, in period one, six people chose red and three chose black. Okay, something like that. Okay? But that, the point is that more pieces of information than another private draw about the state of the world. Right? But, but the, the private draw of the state of the world, the second period is with respect to the true state of the world for period two, and the, and the state may have changed between period one and period two. Okay? You see the, the trade-off? Okay. So on the one hand, if you look at social information, there's a lot more information. There's N guys' guesses, right? On the other hand, the signal in period two is about the state of the world that's actually in operation for period two. Okay? I'll show you how this matters in a moment. So in period two, the optimal policy actually depends on the persistence of the state. Okay? Is, is that clear? Yeah? Um, can you tell the participants what the persistence probability is? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I should say that. So, N, P, and Q are uh, common knowledge, I would say, but I don't, I'm not sure I believe in common knowledge. They're public knowledge, so everyone knows the, well, we read, the, we read them out loud. And we actually, we also gave the subject some experience with the persistence of the state. So, uh, they would see that it, they draw, you know, the, the urns would change with some probability P. Okay? Yeah. yeah. I guess two questions. When yeah. you say uh, the state changes, do you mean it changes, for this the probability P, it changes from red to black or it changes urns? Uh, this, it's the same thing in our case. So uh, there's two urns, the red well, urn and the black. black. Yeah. It's not the same thing though because it can be, if it's the red urn, then if it stays in the red urn forever, then it's still 30% of the time it'll be black. Whereas... Oh no, no, I mean, I mean the state changes. It's the state changes. But I associate the state with the urn. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess the second question is, after they guess at each for the next period, yeah. are the subjects told what the state actually is? Yes, they are. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I haven't got to that, but they're gonna not only are they gonna learn the state. So all information is revealed at the end of period two. Okay. They're gonna learn what state of the world it was. They're gonna learn not only um, whether they got it right or not, but they're gonna we're gonna tell them ex post to promote learning. What was the other piece of information that you didn't choose? What was that? What did that reveal? Okay. That way they can learn over time to assess the relative value of private versus social information. Okay. Well, let me keep going. There's a, more, there's a few more details to fill in here. Um, so, uh, uh, okay, this, this, this next slide, I, if I do it right, will give you an overview of the timing of everything. So here's the... Here's the structure. I'm trying to learn to do animations. Let's see if this works. So in period one, we're going to choose the state for period one. Let's call it X or Y, okay? Or red or black, whatever you want to call it. Um, then every player I draws a signal of the state for period one. We'll call the signal lowercase X or Y, okay? The precision of lowercase X or Y is the parameter Q. Okay, so here's a formal definition. So Q is just the probability that your signal, so conditional on the state being X, Q is the probability that your signal is accurate. Okay, and similarly for Y. Then you guess the state of the world. Okay, everybody does that. That's going to create the social information that we're going to use uh, subsequently. In period two, the state of the world is X or Y with uh, persistence P, okay? It remains the same with probability one minus P, we flip. We were X, we go to Y, we were Y, we go to X. Then, then, this is the critical step, okay? This is the thing we're interested in. The first period is not that interesting, right? The question is here, what information do you choose 
do you choose um, the current private signal? You can draw a signal from this, uh, from the new state of the world with accuracy Q, or do you look at the n previous guesses? Okay, that's the setup. So there, that's the information you would get. You would only get one piece of information. Notice in this case you're drawing a signal. In this case you're looking at chosen action. So actually the compliance rate of, of guesses with the signals received is important, right? The people have to actually guess according to their signal in period one or that more information in period one is not so useful, right? We'll come to that. Okay, and then um, you guess uh, the state of the world in period two, that's the end of the game. Okay? It's, a round, it's a round of the game. We're going to play many rounds of this game with the same group of people. That's the idea. Okay, let me uh, tell you about how to think about uh, the model. So here's a little bit of formalization. It's, it's pretty simple though. So if everyone's rational, and, and, and this is the rational choice benchmark, we'll call Q sub n the probability the majority is correct in period one. Okay? That is, of the n guys, the majority guessed the state correctly. The accuracy in that case of social information, okay, accuracy is a function of n, p, and q, is the, so this is the accuracy from the perspective of period two now, because that's when you're going to choose it. The probability p, the state remains the same in period two. q, n of q is the accuracy of social information Right? But it's also possible with probability 1 minus p, the, the state of the world changes. And with probability 1 minus q of n, the, the majority uh, got it uh, uh, wrong. So um, if you followed the majority and they were wrong and the state flipped, you'd be right. Okay? So <laughs> the overall thing is the accuracy of social information. Does it make, is it clear? Now, these are the two ways that uh, social information can be accurate. Okay, now I'll try, I'm, gonna, I'm playing around with animations here, so we'll see how this works. Um, okay, so here's the accuracy of social information. Here's the persistence, the persistence of the state of the world, okay? I'm going to show you what the optimal policy is, basically. Um, so, if you uh, follow the majority, you choose social information and follow the majority, then um, the accuracy of social information is going to be increasing in the persistence of the state. Okay? The logic of that is, if the state is highly persistent, then um, relying on the social information uh, in the previous period is going to be uh, very accurate. Okay? Yeah? Oh, you said earlier that you tell them what the actual state of the world was. Is that after period two? Yeah, after period two. No, no, nothing is revealed until the end of period two. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. On the other hand, there's another possibility, which is doing the opposite of the majority. So when the persistence of the state of the world is very low, okay, what you might want to do, suppose it's less than 0.5, right? So this means, this is, so less than 0.5 means it's very likely the state of the world is changing, right? In this case, what you might want to do is do the opposite of what the majority did in the first period, right? But social information is also useful in this case, right? In some sense, right? Because if the persistence is very low, right, then you could look to the first period, what the majority did in that case, and then do the opposite in period two, right? Okay, that's interesting. So I'm gonna now compare following the majority with what? The other option you have is let's draw a signal from the urn for the current state of the world in period two, right? Let's just compare that. So in our experiment, we're going to parameterize that, I told you, at 0 0.7, 0 0.7, right? Okay? So here's the idea, basically. It's pretty intuitive. If, relative to a prior 50-50, the persistence of the, the state of the world is less than a half, right? Um, there's, there's a point at which looking at social information dominates private information, right, if the persistence is low, right, and if the persistence is high, social information also dominates private information, right. But if we're in this region in the middle, okay, defined by this, these intersection points here, 
then it's better to use private information than social information. Okay? Is, it, is that clear? So, so, I mean, one motivation, oh, here's it. I always see people ask me for motivation. So here's an example. So I think about, let's compare hotel and restaurant reviews online. You could read, right? So that's social information, right? What's the private thing? It's to actually go to the hotel or the restaurant and eat there and decide on your own, okay? If the state of the world is highly persistent, then you might put a lot of weight on the social information. For example, a hotel, okay? What's the principal attribute of a hotel that we care most about? The location, right? Is the location of a hotel persistent? Yes, right? They're not gonna move the hotel, right? So you could go online and look at reviews of hotels, okay? That'd be very informative about the quality of that hotel. Maybe not the quality, but the location, right? If you think about restaurants by contrast, okay? Restaurants might be more uh, the, state of the, the state of quality of the restaurant might not be as persistent, right? For example, the chef could leave, the wait staff could leave, right? Could be a variable experience from one night to the next. In that case, you might be better off with the private information of going there yourself than relying on the social information. So that's the, that's the flavor of this persistence parameter is how persistent is the state of the world that we're learning about using social information or using private information, okay? That's the, that's the idea. And we're gonna parameterize this in such a way that we're gonna study cases here, here, and here in our experiment. So let's see if my animation works here. Oh yeah, like that. Okay, so one, one value of P will be 0.9, okay? So P at 0.9 means the state of the world is very persistent. In that case, it's the, your rational, your optimal policy is not to choose private information, the accuracy of social information will be higher. Okay, then another case we'll study will be right there. The persistence of the world is 0.6. The accuracy of social information here, or you can think about it here as well, but this is, this is where P is, we're gonna choose 0.6, um, is less than 0.6, so you wanna go private information when the state of the world is point, the persistence of the state of the world is 0.6. And then finally, the, the thing we did, the last thing we did was, we said a persistence of the world of 0.1, it's very erratic. We wanted to make sure that if people are choosing social information, it's not just for conformity purposes. In this case, you should choose social information, but do the opposite of what the majority did last time, right? So that's kind of non-conformity. We want to make sure that if people are using social information, they're really thinking about the value of that information and not just conforming to the social, social uh, information, okay? Is it clear? So that's, the, that's basically our uh, experimental design. And we, you know, we have a little theory that predicts all this stuff. Um, there's basically the, you know, the, the optimal policy and the perfect Bayesian equilibrium, if you want to see the accuracy measures. If the persistence of the state of the world is 0.9, the, the accuracy of private information is always Q, it's 0.7. Accuracy of social information will be higher here and here. This is in the 0.1 case and it's lower here. So your optimal policy is social information when P is 0.9, social information, and, and follow the majority. Here it's follow, follow, do the opposite of the majority when persistence is 0.1, and here it's choose private information and follow it. This is all in period two of our, our model. Okay, so period one is just to generate the data that we have a choice over looking at in period two. Okay, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the design of my experiment. And I um, hope I don't have to motivate experiments, but you know, this is not an environment that exists in the real world, and so we're gonna invite uh, people to participate in our um, experiment. So I'm using here the convenience sample of undergraduates. Uh, uh, it's not clear to me that there's any professionals uh, in this game, but you know, you could, I suppose, uh, look at uh, PhD students or uh, 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 people who are good at Bayes rule. But you're gonna see that these undergraduates are, are remarkably good, pretty good at this game. Not 100%, pretty good. So the first, I told you there's two parts. The first part will be two period rounds under one value for P, okay? 48 rounds and a round is two periods, okay? Then the second part will be 48 two period rounds under a different P. So the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna start off with, for example, and this change in P is not announced in advance. We're going to start off with a persistence of 0.9, 0.1, 0.2, 0.3, 0.4, 0.5, 0.6, 0.7, 0.8, 0.9, 0.10, 0.11, 0.12, 0.13, 0.14,
And then we're going to go to a persistence of 0.6. So the prediction here would be you would choose social information in the first 48 periods, or two rounds, two, two period rounds, and then you would choose private information in the last 48 rounds, okay? Is that clear? We can do the opposite. We, we're gonna reverse the order. So we'll, on another, on another group of subjects, we'll start with 0.6 and then we'll move to 0.9. So we'll call this the 0.6 to 0.9 treatment. We'll call this the 0.9 to 0.6. We also did, so you notice that we have a lot of 0.6 in here because that's the only parameterization of the three we consider where private information is what you should choose. But we wanted to look at social versus private. So this is the social information environment where you should choose social information where you do the opposite of the majority. So we do that and then we do 0.6 and then we reverse the order of that. So is it clear? The, basically there's four treatments we call it. We collected a lot of information on gender and age and other Many other demographic pieces of information. We also collected information on cognitive abilities, and um, this I'm very interested in. I maybe you know, some of you know more about this, but we um, we collected information on a, we, uh, on this uh, cognitive reflection test. Have you ever seen this? There's three questions they ask, and and uh, the the test gives you a measure of how cognitively uh, thoughtful you are. Uh, the test questions all involve some simple. Uh, simple obvious answer that's wrong, but upon reflection, you would get the right answer if you spent some time. Have, have you, anybody seen these questions? You, okay, yeah, all right. So it's actually, uh, it, it, it turns out that it, it, it helps explain the extent to which people are rational uh, information choosers in our environment. We also, we also did something that's a little bit unconventional. We took the, we asked for people's majors, okay? Just their major, uh, undergraduate major. And we, we associated with the major the um, average GRE score of people with those majors, okay? And the reason we did this was to get a quantitative measure of the value of a major, okay? And there's quite a bit of dispersion in GRE. There's more than in SAT, so that's why we use GRE, okay? And that's another cognitive measure, highly correlated with the CRT, by the way. So, um, so we, uh, we have these cognitive uh, measures as well. Anyway. I'll talk, if I have time, I'll talk about this. It's, it's kind of interesting. Anyway, we did, we did payments of the, of the following. We, you, you, we randomly chose one round from the first part. There were 48 of them. You got $6 if your guess is correct. We chose another round from the second part, another $6, and then $6 for completing part three. And there was a show up payment of $6. So in total, you can make 24, up to $24 for, um, for uh, this uh, experiment, which lasted about an hour. So we have 144 total subjects. So, um, as I mentioned, there's some feedback and information at the end of every round that reminded of the guesses that they made, the information they chose, and its content, and the state of the world uh, in each of the two periods, okay? So they, um, they got all that feedback, but not till the end of the round. And as I mentioned, they were shown the content of the information they did not choose. This was so that they could learn possibly over time whether private or social information was more valuable. Okay? A, lot, a lot of learning models don't say that this kind of feedback is not important, uh, but we think it, it might be. You know? uh, so we, we gave it to them. Um, we showed them the history of past rounds and and how um, other subjects chose information not reveal. Okay, so you're not learning about how other people are choosing information. You, you just, you can potentially look at the information and uh, choices that they make. Okay, a couple of things. Uh, this is maybe a little bit uh, unsurprising. If we first looked at what happens in the first period. Remember in the first period, you're not choosing information or anything. You're just getting a signal and asked to guess the state of the world, right? So you should just, you should just guess the state of the world according to your signal. Okay, that's pretty simple. If the signal has 70% accuracy, what do you do? You guess the state of the world corresponding to your signal. Uh, this is just to point out that uh, about 98% compliance rate, okay? So not 100%, but pretty high. It turns out that for our predictions, I didn't mention this, but for our predictions, you know, about when you should use social or private information, we need a compliance rate of 77% for those predictions to go through, okay? So we're well above that threshold, 98%. That means they're complying. This is just, this is a basic rationality test, okay? First period, you get a signal, do you do the right thing? Answer, 98% of the time, 
Okay. Um, okay, let me show you a picture of the overall frequencies here. This is kind of a high level view of the results. So I'm going to have to step back and see my high level view here so I can make sense of it. Okay, so we can classify people uh, lots of ways. So ask here means social and P means private. And F means follow and N means not. So not follow means don't follow the information that you chose to see. Um, type 1 guys are optimal. Uh, so what does that mean? In the environment where the persistence is 0.9, you choose social information and you follow it. That's what SF means. And you can see that 76.13% uh, of our subjects can be classified as that type in the 0.9 persistent environment. In the 0.6 persistent environment, um, the optimal strategy is private information and follow it. And here again, 74% of our subjects are doing that. In the point one case, the strategy is social information and not follow it. And again, large percentage, 75.52% are doing, are doing that. Right? Um, okay, what, what, what else do we see? We see there's type two and type three and type four. So type two are choosing the right, the wrong information but they're using it. That's the next most common category, by the way. Type three is they're choosing the wrong information and the wrong use of that information, so they're really confused. So like uh, here, it's persistence of 0.6, you're choosing social information and not following it. And then th that's not a very large percentage. So, and then type four is right information, wrong use. So you see here, the, the big picture here is that a, 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 a large percentage within a particular environment are, are doing the right thing, but there's a sizable fraction uh, who, uh, you know, maybe a quarter here, I think it's more like 20% overall, maybe it's more than that. But we're going to focus on these type 2 guys who are around 20%. Um, they're doing something that's a little bit at odds with uh, what we would have predicted. Here's another picture of the data. This is more striking, perhaps. Um, so, if you think of the social information choice, this is the periods. So you can see in the, the point 0.1 and the point 0.9 treatments, these green bars, this is the number of subjects who are choosing social information in all 48 periods. Okay? Whereas in the point 0.6 treatment, you can see this is the percentage who are never choosing social information. It means they're choosing private information. Okay? This is a cumulative uh, frequency distribution of the same information. So you can see a stark separation. The persistence is 0.6, right? They're choosing private information. Um, and uh, that's why there's a lot of mass at zero here on the choice of social information. Okay? Whereas if the persistence is 0.1 or 0.9, they're choosing social information with a higher frequency. You can see that. Uh, a big jump here. This is the number of periods. This is the periods in which they chose social information. Um, you can also look at this in terms of rational choice. That's just a, another version of the same chart. Okay. Um, let me uh, do the first of some indices. So we've been coming up with uh, ways of presenting the data. So I've been I'm just experimenting with different things. So tell me if something is uh, interesting or not interesting. So we're going to come up with what we're going to call a lone wolf index. Your index of uh, preference for being antisocial. Okay. Yeah, think of it that way. Your lone wolfness. Okay. It's a bias towards private information. So it's a, basically a count. It's just a count. Let's take the number of private information choices in part one and the number of private information choices in part two and let's subtract. Remember there's 48 choices in part one and 48 choices in part two. Let's subtract from that sum 48 and divide by 48. What does it mean? It means, first of all, the index will be between negative 1 and 1. 1 means that you always chose private information, right? So it's like 48 plus 48 minus 48 divided by 48 is 1, okay? Minus 1 meant all these numbers were 0. So you ended up with negative 48 over 48, right? always chose social, and then a, a lone wolf index of zero, this is, 
not an indicator yet of rational choice, but it's an indicator just of bias in some sense. Lone wolf index of zero means that your information is unbiased, okay? Either you chose correct information always, or your mistakes were e equally distributed in the two environments. Okay, you got that? So now let's look at the lone wolf index. Um, so you can see it's centered at zero. That's consistent with rational choice, although I haven't established that yet. But it's symmetric about zero. So it means that there's some lone wolves, they're here, and there's some herd animals, they're here, okay? A nice symmetric distribution. Here's a cumulative frequency distribution of the same data. Okay, um, so there's no clear asymmetry in the information bias that we could find, just looking at the data this way. Okay, um, so let me say a little bit more about the lone wolf index. The mean was actually almost zero. Slightly negative, but almost imperceptibly. You can't reject symmetry. Um, there are negative payoff consequences to these biases, but they're also symmetric because of our within subject design. Half the time you're in one environment, half the time you're in the other. And so the distribution of expected payoffs is also symmetric with respect to the lone wolf index. So herd animals on average lose the same amount as lone wolves. So you can't explain it in terms of payoff incentives. That's by design. Now let's combine that with something else. I'm going to call this an optimality index. I'm going to put the two together. So an optimality index is this. Remember that when, there's, when we're in a, a treatment where, where social information is the optimal response, that's when P is 0.9 and P is 0.1, then um, what you should do is choose social information. And, and in the private information uh, treatment, you should choose private information. Uh, to do the opposite, and, and, and you should, and you should uh, follow this information, but to do the opposite is irrational. So we also constructed an information optimality index, but we just looked at the percentage of rational choices of information. Okay, so this says if you're in the 0.6, the P equals 0.6 treatment, how many times out of the 48 did you choose private information? Okay? And then when you were in the uh, persistent 0.9 or 0.1 treatment, whichever one you were in, how many of the 48 times there did you choose um, social information? Okay? So a perfect score here, 100% means when, when you're in the erratic environment, you always chose private information. And when you were in the social, the persistent environment, you always chose social. Is that clear? That's different than lone wolfness because uh, this is now uh, conditioning on, this is now conditioning on the persistence, not just the number of times you chose private or social information. So here's a picture and I uh, apologize, the density, this is kernel density, so it's the wrong, I should make it frequency, it's in the paper. Um, the point here is that there's a big spike here at 50%, so what does it mean? It means in 50% of the, f the total of, uh, uh, I guess it's 96 periods, you were doing the rational thing. This means that you could potentially be a herd, herd animal or lone wolf, like 50% means in one of the treatments, you were doing the right thing, but you were doing the wrong thing in the other one. There's also a big spike here at 100%. So, um, so the main finding of our within subject design here is heterogeneity. If I now combine the lone wolf and the information optimality indices, I'm going to show you the three main types, the optimal lone wolves and herd animals. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to combine these. Yeah. Um, you may be getting this. Did you look at, uh, were there order effects in terms of? Yeah, we did. Um, yeah, uh, there's no order effects. <laughs> I have a slide on that somewhere, but uh, in the paper, we, we check whether there's order. You mean if I do uh, 0.1 and then 0.6, and I reverse the order 0.6 and 0.1, yeah. Yeah, is it like if they use one strategy and yeah. one, is there a persistence? There isn't any order effect that we could detect. So I should have, I had that on a slide somewhere, but I took it out to save time, but that's a good point. Yeah? Oh, I just wanted to check. Um, did you check to see how well participants understand the probability when you're telling them, you know, like there's probably 0.9 as well as yeah. the same? Yeah, so what we did was pre before we, before we even ran the experiment, okay, we uh, simulated 
uh, just showing them how the what point nine meant for the switching of the urn. So we we had them actually uh, guess which urn it was uh, from one period to the next uh, with the persistence of point nine, and we showed them what the result. So we tried very hard to, because we know people are bad at probabilities, right? right? So we tried very hard to give them some training. And we also did the same, not for just for persistence, but also for the signal precision. We had them draw balls out of the urn. Right. That was the black urn. And they learned over time, you know, that, oh yeah, 70% of the time I'm drawing a black ball, okay? So we tried very hard to do that. Okay. Um, did yeah. you see any variance in how well the participants understood that? Because I'm wondering if the people who are the herd animals and the lone wolves are most of the people who didn't ever really grasp the probability. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I'm gonna, I'm, I don't have metrics on how well they, well they grasped that, because um, we were just doing it as part of training, but I'm gonna show you that it's gonna be reflected in cognitive abilities based on this cognitive reflection test. We can, we can uh, say something about the two types, okay, the bias types, okay? But let me put these two charts together, because this is, I spent a lot of time on this picture, so uh, I, I really like it. Okay, so let me try to explain it. This is my information optimality index. It goes from zero to 100%, okay? So 100% optimal means you always made the right choice in all uh, 96 two-round periods, okay? Then, Here's the lone wolf index. Remember, this is just a number of, this is just a count. A count of the number of times you chose private information. One would be 96 times you chose private information. Minus one would be 96 times you chose social information. The optimality index combined with that count provides the, the vertices here of this diamond of rationality. How's that for a term? Okay. Um, okay, well, where are our types? Here's the pure optimal guys. Notice that their lone wolf index is zero. Their optimality index is one, right? Yeah? This is, the, this is a, by the way, a scatter plot of our data, okay? Um, this are, these are individual subjects. So every subject here is a diamond, and they, they're, they're two-dimensional uh, uh, in, in the optimality index and lone wolf. Here's the pure herd animals. And there's the pure lone wolves. And you can see, okay, we're, we're mostly in, 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 along these, uh, these, uh, these lines are uh, uh, logically constructed from these vertices. Uh, you can see there's this big mass here, but there's also some considerable fraction of people who, these guys have a taste for social information, right? They're, they're doing it right exactly 50% of the time. In the environments where the state is persistent enough, that's where social information is rational. In the other environment, they shouldn't be using the social information. Symmetrically, there's also some pure lone wolves, right? People are just like, I don't care about other people, right? I'm anti-social or something. I'm going to just go with my private information. Okay, yeah? What do you explain about the pure non-optimal person on the left? Yeah, okay, we just one, just one, this guy was, you know, on, on drugs or something. Yeah. <laughs> so really not, not, not there. But there's not a lot of pure rational people. So if you're purely rational, you would just be, you know, if you thought we had monkeys banging on keyboards, we would, maybe we'd be here, I don't know. Um, but, but, you know, there's, there's some evidence that, okay, we're kind of moving this. So, so a lot of our subjects are you know, I don't have time to show you the, the learning dynamics, but a lot of guys start out here and then they move this way. If I look at t over time, I'm seeing a lot of movement. If initial, the first few periods might be here, well, not first few periods, it's hard to say, but there's some movement in this direction, okay? Um, I have a slide on it if I have time. Um, okay, let me talk about a couple, let me talk about, I'm gonna talk about three behavioral models that could potentially explain this. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you in advance, and I'm going to talk about a fairly new model called rational inattention. Has anyone heard of this model? It's pretty new. In economics, it's all the rage right now. So you might like this. It's, it's pretty interesting. I'll talk about a, a couple of models that might explain uh, this diamond in some sense. Okay? So we'll call them alternatives. Alternatives to what? Rational choice theory, which is our, our benchmark in economics. So first alternative is what we call a level K model. I don't know if this has made it outside of economics. So 
So a level K model is just different. You imagine that people are of different cognitive ability levels. There's a hierarchy, okay? So the lowest level, level zero, they're people that just choose randomly, okay? You have to define what level zero means, but level zero essentially means people are just banging on the keyboard doing mindless stuff, okay? Then you think about, well, if I'm the next level up, if I'm level one, okay, I play a best response to my assumption that everyone is below me, right? That's a kind of natural assumption, right? We always think we're here and everyone else is below, right? We don't imagine there's people of higher levels of cognitive ability, just lower, right? And that's an assumption of this, of this theory. So level K analysis says what? It says uh, level zero guys, we'll, we'll say, are just choosing randomly. Uh, given that, level ones, if they think that everyone below them is choosing randomly, they'll want to choose private information always, right? Why? Because there's no value to the social information if everyone is an idiot and, and choosing randomly, right? Okay? So the level one guys in this, this level K analysis, uh, this is pretty standard non-equilibrium analysis, in economics, they would always choose private information. Level two guys realize that the level one guys are going to behave in this way, level two and above, even level three and four and so on. And so starting with level two, these guys would act optimally um, since the level one guys are doing the private information thing now, um, the standard, standard level K model doesn't assume there's, there's a hierarchical structure. Just level two guys believe that only people below them are level one. There's no level zeros and so on. Um, anyway, that doesn't matter, even if you had a hierarchy. The level two and above say, let's act optimally because the level one guys are doing the private signal thing, and so their information is useful and so if social information is useful. But overall, this would, be, this would in, indicate a bias towards private information because these level one guys believe that everyone below them is level zero. There would be a bias towards lone wolf behavior. Yeah? Is there a level three where they understand that the level, level two people are just copying the level one people and so now there's a surplus of social information in the area? Well, remember the, uh, the level two guys are acting optimally now. So it means that since the level one guys are choosing private information, um, the level two guys, if private inf if social information is valuable, they'll follow it, right? The level three guys don't imagine that there's level one guys. They just imagine that everybody's level two. So remember, we're, we're truncating at just the level below. Yeah. Um, if you had a distribution of types below you and you knew that distribution, then you would have to condition on that information. Okay, but the point is that this theory doesn't really explain, uh, this doesn't have a bias towards lone wolf behavior. Um, we don't find a bias. We find basically equal numbers of lone wolves and, and herd animals. A second alternative, which would probably take me a long time to explain, but um, in, in, uh, in behavioral game theory, there's this idea of quantal response equilibrium, which is essentially that um, we know that people make mistakes, okay? And so instead of playing a rational best response to just knowing P and Q, I take account of those mistakes, and I adjust, I, ha I play what's called a noisy best response, okay? Um, so I don't know that you guys probably don't know this, but um, the payoffs of choosing social information and using it correctly are gonna be reduced in this case, but the payoff to choosing social information and not following it are being increased. And so, anyway, this approach predicts that the error rate is essentially symmetric across our treatments, uh, but it fails to explain the heterogeneity that we observe. I'll just show you the prediction of this model, this quantal response model. Our quantal response model predicts that behavior will be right here, <laughs> okay? Uh, which you could think of it as just finding the average in some sense of uh, these observations. This is a little bit different figure. This is expected payoff as a function of the lone wolf index. But you can see that this, this model doesn't predict very well the heterogeneity that we're observing. So let me tell you about a model that does work, because that's the one I'm most excited about. Oh, and before I do that, let me talk about personality features and cognitive abilities, because some of you might be interested in that. Um, we did elicit a bunch of information on person, so not, we'll call it cognitive and non-cognitive traits, okay? Um, we completed a personality test and they asked subjects to indicate the 
use a six item Likert scale about always, frequently, sometimes, occasionally, rarely. Questions like this, feeling that winning or losing doesn't matter to me, avoid situations involving competition, drawing to compete with others, uh, various personality traits. Uh, we've used these before. Um, I, don't, I don't know that this is that value, but we're trying to look at whether non-cognitive traits matter. And um, we also uh, did some simple regression analysis of our um, lone wolf index on some other variables that we had, so age and female. Uh, as female is a dummy for whether the uh, participant was female. Um, so this is the lone wolf index, if you remember, is going to be highest when what? Uh, you choose private information all the time. And you can see that uh, females are less, somewhat less likely to choose to be uh, uh, high on the lone wolf index. Some of these personality traits, so understand means I understand others. That's negatively correlated with lone wolfness. And um, I mistrust others is positively correlated with lone wolfness. So there's some personality traits in our subject pool that, uh, that have some bearing on, on the amount of lone wolfness. Um, but um, it's going to mainly uh, be uh, through cognitive differences that I think we can explain our data the best. So let me talk about this next, because this is what I'm most excited about now. And what we're doing is we're, uh, we're uh, uh, trying to find a way to explain the heterogeneity in our model. And we came across this uh, rational inattention approach, which is now very popular in economics. Um, one paper that uh, we're closely associated with here is Mateshka and McKay in um, the American Economics Group. So the idea here of rational attention is that some, uh, sometimes it's rational to not be too attentive uh, to uh, 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 decisions that we have to make in life. Okay, So there's decision costs, and sometimes it's just not worth the effort. Why? There's, there's different mental costs, right? There, what are the costs in our experiment? Costs are of trying to figure out the value of social information, right? Not that easy. The value of private information is 0.7. Uh, that's the accuracy. But the value of social information is varying, right? So it could be high, it could be low, and there's some cost to figuring that out, right? It's not trivial to do the calculations that we did, right? So the model is a two-stage model, or the first stage you basically decide you have some prior belief, you have a prior, and your prior, the way I think about the prior here is the prior would be that um, social information is less accurate than private information, okay? Or, so, so you have a prior on that. So zero means you think that uh, social information is uh, uh, useless, and one means that you think social information is way better than private. So some, Think of that distribution. And um, in addition, uh, you have some information costs, okay? There's some decision cost in your head about how much mental effort to apply, okay? So uh, the signal here could be the result of your cognitive analysis of whether uh, social is more valuable than private. So, um, so if you have a high cognitive cost, right? Maybe you have some load on your working memory. Then you're not going to necessarily work out which is more accurate, but you instead go with your prior. Okay, so that's the rational inattention model. So if you face high decision costs, right, then um, you may say, uh, "I'll just—it's too hard for me to figure out. I'll go with my prior." Okay, but if you have low Decision costs, you may be willing to work it out, what, what's better, social or private information, and then you choose optimally. So that's, that's the essence of the theory. Uh, let me show you one slide to throw it into a choice framework. So probably you've seen some version of a logic choice rule. The standard rule would say that uh, the probability that I choose uh, uh, some action I is related to the payoff or the value of action i. Let's call that v. Okay. But what rational inattention theory does is it throws in an extra term alpha, okay, which distorts the choice based on expected payoffs to account for two things: your decision cost, 
mental effort, and your prior. Okay? So that's all that it does. So um, alpha is a bias that depends on the prior and the cost of information. So think of uh, the, the standard uh, parameter that's used in these uh, models is beta, but we can think of, um, so higher beta is more accurate decision, so uh, if I have a higher beta, I have a lower decision cost. That's the way to think about it. Have you seen a logic choice rule before for choosing under, um, choosing from among many alternatives? Okay, so here's the idea. When the cost of information is high, the prior has a strong influence. So maybe my prior is social information is always better. I don't want to think about this, so I'll just go with my prior. Okay? Or alternatively, I think, no, no, private information is always better. If my decision cost is high, I don't do the reasoning, I go with my prior. That's, that's what it means to be rationally inattentive. Right? It's too hard for me to figure out, I go with a prior. Okay? Pretty simple. Uh, let me show you, uh, this is just a simulation now. Well, it's a kind of simulation exercise. So here's an idea of how the theory works. So think of G, G, okay, the way to think of G here is my prior belief that social information is less valuable than private information, okay? Less valuable. So a G of one means I really think social information is useless, okay? Private information is always greater. And over here, a prior of zero means I think private information is useless and social information is always better. Okay? Then all you've got to do in this model is think about the decision cost. We can, I chose three here. Okay, this is parameterized for our experiment in terms of NP and Q. And la lambda L is a low decision cost. Lambda M is a medium decision cost. And lambda high is a high decision cost. Okay? So here's, this is the logit a response function for choosing, uh, uh, say, optimally, so choosing choosing social or uh, uh, private information. So I'll go through it. It's very simple. So suppose your decision costs are really high. That's this dashed line here. Okay. It means that if your prior that uh, social information is more valuable than private information is sufficiently high, that's this region here. You just go with your you go with that prior and your lone wolf index is negative one. It means that you're a guy who just looks at social information all the time. And you can see that there's not much room for ambiguity for these high decision cost guys. As soon as the prior goes, uh, you know, uh, a little bit above 0.6 here, they're just always lone wolf guys, right? They just go with the prior. Okay, the guys who have lowest decision costs have this logit response function looks like this. So it says unless their priors are extreme, here or here, they actually deliberate because their costs are low enough and they figure out what's optimal. That means their lone wolf index is going to be right around zero here, okay? You see? So that's the, that's the rational inattention view. It just says it can be rational to be inattentive if what? The costs of making the decisions are too high. And then in that case, I just go with my prior. Yeah, social information, that, that works. Right? I mean, I think this is, this is a, a new the a relatively new theory, but I think it has a lot of um, explanatory power. I mean, one thing, the reason it can explain what we're doing that's interesting is if the priors are dispersed, right? If they're dispersed, and if there's some decision costs that are, some people face high decision costs, then I can get, some lone wolf guy, I mean some uh, herd animal guys and some lone wolf guys, okay? If the priors are dispersed, okay? And there's some decision costs, okay? So let me uh, summarize uh, that idea. So here's a kind of a table to explain this. So if I think of lambda as the decision cost and g is the prior, g is the prior that um, uh, social information is useful. Um, so if the prior of social information being useful is low and the decision cost is high, I just go with my prior and I'm a, a lone wolf. Okay? Yeah? Is the decision cost just the internal decision cost or is that relative to the um, expected reward? No, okay, I'm going to say something about that. It's a personal characteristic of you. 
okay, of each individual subject. And I'm going to show you some information that cognitive ability, I'm going to try to correlate cognitive measures with decision costs. Yeah. So if, if you find the problem hard, it's not maybe because you can't do math, you might have just a load on your brain at the moment in time, right? Uh, but you're, the cost of decision making is hard for you personally, yeah. So, so if you face these high costs and you have a low prior that social information is useful, you're what we'll call a lone wolf according to this theory. If uh, the cost is high and the prior uh, social information being uh, useful is, is high, then you're a herd animal. I think I keep changing what G means, but uh, here it's clear. And then if, if, if the decision cost is low, then you just do the right thing, okay? You figure it out and you do the right thing, okay? So the rational intention theory predicts that the prior um, and uh, uh, basically affects only those with high cognitive costs, or you can think of it as low ability people. Uh, so um, I'll show you now some evidence for that based on our, we, we came up with this imputed GRE approach, and this has not been peer reviewed yet, so I'm not sure that it's right. Uh, but here's what we did. I told you we took people's college major, okay? Self-reported college major, okay? so. English, uh, biology, philosophy, okay? And we took the average GRE score of that major, and we said that's your cognitive ability, that number reflects your, it's the GRE quantitative part, by the way, not the verbal part. Okay, so that's what GREQ means, okay? And we, we divided our group by the median GRE score, so the median was 153, so we look at those to the left of 153 and those to the right of 153. And then what we did was we took, the, we just regressed their lone wolf index on some measures here. Uh, and what we can see is that, I mean, I don't know how convincing this is, but personality measures um, seem to matter, like I understand others, uh, comes out as an explanatory factor in the lone wolfness for those with the low uh, GRE. So we want to interpret this as personality measures matter. Um, these are F tests, so these are important, I suppose. Not so much mistrusting. But those with the high cognitive ability, the personality traits are not uh, mattering so much for their lone wolfness, okay? So that's some evidence. There is also, we also did some regressions of uh, lone wolf, uh, wolfness on um, cognitive abilities, and it's also highly correlated. Um, so so that's, um, that's the basic message. Um, I can tell you another implication of this rational attention model is that it matches another qualitative feature of our data. Uh, if we look at um, between versus within subject measures, so this is a little bit hard to explain, but if I just looked at the rationality of people in a particular environment, say the 0.9 persistence treatment, okay, that would tend to overstate the degree of rationality as compared with to the within subject design. And the rational inattention model also predicts that. Okay? That's a subtlety that we think is really interesting. Um, uh, and I will try to explain it to you using some pictures. So, if I, let's think about um, an artificial population of players who differ in cognitive costs and priors. And if I think about the data in a within subject sense, so everybody faces the two environments, or I look at uh, identical populations facing just one environment, okay? If I look at uh, the rational inattention model with dispersed priors, what I find is that in a a between subject approach, this is the cumulative frequency of, 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 uh, of uh, um, optimal information uh, choice. Um, it looks like, um, well, what happens is that you can see there's nothing in terms of the within subject design until you get to this 50%. Uh, and then, then all of a sudden the within subject approach uh, shows that there's a, uh, um, there's a, a, there's a difference a relative to this between subject approach. 
So if I look at this, this is the prediction, by the way, of the uh, rational inattention model, and it requires that there be dispersed priors. Okay, if there's dispersed priors, then the idea is that um, that in 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 the, in the one environment, in the within subject design, people will perform perfectly well, or they'll perform uh, perfectly horribly. Um, here, this is the optimality of zero. But then when you switch the environment, they'll, they'll perform better. Uh, that prediction is hard to explain uh, versus the between subject design, but the rational and attention model makes this prediction, and this is what our data looks like. So it looks also very similar. This is the actual data. What we did was we took the optimality of everybody in a particular environment, okay, as opposed to in the two different environments. That's the red line versus the blue line. And this, uh, this is something that the model predicts uh, uh, rather well. So uh, on that dimension, it does, it does pretty, pretty well. Uh, what's important here is that the priors be dispersed. So um, you're only going to see separation into lone wolves and herd animals if the priors are sufficiently dispersed. If they're not dispersed, then the rational inattention model predicts that everyone should be um, pretty optimal, uh, or if they're centered around 50%, uh, I should say. Um, so this, uh, I'll skip this. Um, let me, uh, let me uh, move to conclusions then. Um, okay, so what we found is that there's, um, uh, Unlike what other people have reported in this literature, there's no use, there's no, there's no evidence of excessive preference for private information, okay? Um, what we seem to find is a mix of both lone wolves and herd animals, although they're not the majority of subjects. The majority of subjects in our experiments seem to have instrumental or information gathering um, objectives. That is, they do the right thing. When? The optimal policy is to follow social information they do, and when the optimal policy is to follow private information, they, they choose that information and they follow it. Yeah. Um, so there, there is a majority for this, but there's a, a significant minority uh, of, of, of people who seem to have a strong taste for or against social information. And uh, the point I was trying to make on the last couple of slides is that um, if I don't put people in both environments, okay, then I tend to uh, sweep under the rug, so to speak, the extent of rationality in, in, uh, uh, in making these information choices, right? So we found this big spike in our optimality index of 50%. It means that, uh, essentially, uh, what's going on? Um, many of the subjects are just applying the same heuristic in both environments, right? Uh, so if I didn't think about different environments, if I just use, between subjects means you just go and you play in one environment. If I just look at one environment, rationality looks a lot higher than if I put people in two different environments. Okay. Uh, only 22% are optimal across both environments, okay? So I look at one environment by itself, we saw measures that were in excess of 50%, right? Sometimes 75% doing the right thing. If I put them in two different environments, the measure of people who were perfectly optimal and had a lone wolf index of, of zero was only 22%. Okay, so that's a that's a stark difference. Uh, um, and of the uh, of the people who are not perfectly uh, optimal, there's sort of two types. There's the herd, the pure herds, and the pure lone wolves. And then there's a mixture of people who are learning to use the right type of information over time. Okay, so that's a uh, that's a main finding. Um, you know, we, here's the specific uh, findings. Uh, near rational, 74%. Perfectly rational, 22%. Herd guys, perfect herd guys are 7%. Lone wolves, 5%. Partially rational lone wolves. We can, we can have all kinds of uh, names here. There's a mix of types. So I think we're the, I think we're the first to suggest it's not just a two-way struggle between conformism and rational, but, but it's really three-way. There's, there's herd guys, there's lone wolves, and then there's rational or, or, or near-rational types. Okay? Um, so I'll mention something else I was going to uh, talk about this paper, but I didn't have time. It's in the server, I guess. If you're, I just finished this paper, so um, I'm excited about this. But 
We're now doing a modification of the standard sequential move game that I told you at the beginning, where we allow for binary information choice. So instead of just getting both pieces of information, now you move sequentially in a line. So um, the idea is the first guy in the line should choose private information. The second guy should choose private information. The third guy has to choose private information as well and not switch to social information because the third guy has to take account of time neglect. So the, the first two guys could have split in terms of the private information they got. And so the guy in position three should also choose private information and social after period position four. So this is a sequential move game. In the aggregate, we find that subjects start choosing social information too early in the sequence. They are subject to what's called tie neglect or redundancy neglect. They, they neglect the fact that a lot of people choosing earlier in the sequence were also choosing social information. So there's not as much private information in their choices. Um, anyway, this is another paper. But the results again suggest that there's some symmetry in deviations uh, with again some more lone wolves and uh, herd animals. So um, this is uh, what I'm working on. I hope it was. Uh, uh, interesting, and um, I will stop there. The blind meeting the blind. <laughs>